Okay, so we're back <clears throat> with the second um, video about recitals of Redimir, the orc type. Now, the game itself isn't what's important in these discussions. It's just providing a framework for us to talk about the game design process on the ground level, the in-the-trenches work of creating um, a board game and how we go about doing that, how we make the decisions um, about um, the rules interplay, you know, values on cards and naming and all of these things, how we actually go through this process step by step. Um, this is the latest game that I'm working on. I've only been working on it for a couple of weeks, maybe, um, and I'm using it <clears throat> as the framework for this discussion because it's the most current thing that I'm doing and it represents um, where my head is at uh, right now. Uh, in my development as uh, an amateur designer. So, last time we were talking about the setup of the game, and we got through that. Um, today we're going to be talking about the turn sequence. Um, the turn sequence um, is, is a little bit of a tricky thing uh, for certain types of games because the order of when things happen uh, can sometimes be important, especially in this game. This is a deck building game. Um, and, you know, when cards go to the discard pile, you know, um, when you can move things around, it, it, it has a lot of effect on the interplay between the effects, because you have so many cards with different effects, um, and so as you go through and you're, 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 you're working through this process, you start to realize, hey, wait a minute, if they can do this first before they do this, it's going to create a loop or it's going to, uh, you know, blow the whole game up because they're going to wind up with, you know, 15 cards in their hand and they're just going to sweep the field, you know. So the timing of these things has changed a lot as I've, as I've gone through and I've been working on the cards. If you didn't watch the first video... Um, I'm working in a few different files, and the two main files I'm working in is a, is a rules file and a card file. This is where I make all the cards. So um, most of the time is spent going back and forth between these two things. I make a card, I go back and make sure it's lined up with the rules. If I see something's not working right, I go in and change a rule, or I see something in the rules, I come in and change a card. And so the uh, turn sequence is one of the things that has changed a lot. Um, initially... Uh, you see here the bullet points represent each phase, and the underlined sections are, are steps within those phases. So initially, all of these were phases on their own, and so you could see all these underlined sections were phases. <laughs> so I don't know how many are here, what is it, like 10 underlined things here? It's just way too many phases. Uh, I tried to come up with a way of using the first letter of each phase to create a word or something so you could remember what it, what it was. I mean, of course, there'll be references. Uh, player references in the game, but still, I mean, it's just ridiculous. It's a deck building game. It's not really that complicated. There's been some added uh, mechanisms thrown in and stuff to um, kind of reflect the theme a little bit better and give the game a little bit more depth, but uh, it shouldn't, you know, uh, overwhelm the player in terms of trying to remember what they can do on their turn. I mean, you're basically, you know, uh, you know, generating resources and buying cards for the most part. So, in an effort to try and simplify that, I broke it down here into four phases, each with a number of steps. But let's go through and see how that plays out, because a lot of these steps um, are either very intuitive or uh, optional or don't always happen. Okay, so a player's turn has four phases, each with multiple steps. Each phase and each step occurs in the order described below. Effects that happen at the beginning of a phase or turn trigger first before anything else that happens that phase or turn. Effects that happen at the end of a phase or turn trigger last after everything else that happened that phase. Okay, so again, very intuitive. We all know what that means. At the beginning of your faction phase, uh, it's going to happen first before the other things in the faction phase. But we got to write it because we have to imagine that, um, you know, Encino Man, if you ever saw that movie, <laughs> Encino Man is going to come here and try and play this game, and he's never seen a game before. He doesn't know, you know, beginning of phase, end of phase. So we're going to mention it. But again, this is something you kind of just blow through pretty quickly. I don't know what you think about these parentheses. It seems kind of silly now that I'm looking at it. You know, effects that happen at the beginning of a phase or a turn, trigger first before anything else that happens that phase, or a turn. <laughs> Maybe it should just be, you know, 
phase or turn. Um, but basically, I, I was just trying to show that it's at the beginning of the thing that it's talking about. Um, so I don't know. Maybe maybe we should take these out. Uh, I'll let me think about that at another point. <laughs> All right, so the faction phase is the first thing that's going to happen. And the reason why this is called the faction phase is because these two things that happen relate to aspects of the game that are common between all players of the faction. So if you're playing a two-player game, you're the only person in your faction. But if you're playing a team game, there'll be two people in the faction. And these two things are not specific to the player. They're specific to the faction. So this is the faction phase. Captain turn abilities. Each captain of the active player's faction will trigger their turn effect in the order that they entered the battlefield. Right to left for the champion faction, left to right for the orc faction. All right, let's stop there. Why is it right to left for one faction and left to right to the other? Um, unfortunately, I don't believe I have an image of this. Let me let me see. Hmm, no, okay. Well, <clears throat> basically, it's a head-to-head -head scenario. So if my champion comes out and your champion comes out, they're going to be next to each other, right? Then if my next champion comes out, that card's going to go behind the first one that came out. So if I'm the good guys, the champions, it's going to go to the left of my card. But when the bad guys next... Um, captain comes out, it's going to go to the right of their card, behind it. So those first two who came out are always going to be face to face. And everybody else is going to fall in line behind them to either side. Okay, so that's why it's left to right, right to left. Now remember, this is all going to be in pictures when the rule book actually gets done. So, you know, the level to which we're able to describe this accurately is not really a big deal because they're just going to be able to look at it and see. Um, but that's how I chose to, to describe it here. Okay, so now each captain will trigger their turn effect. All right, so this is, a, this is an effect that the captain does each turn. So this captain comes out of the deck, goes into an area called the battlefield. It's basically just an ongoing card that sits out there. It's a permanent card that um, is going to have an effect each and every turn. And the effect it's going to have is, is called the turn ability because the captains also have other abilities. <clears throat> Remember that commanders are also captains, and their turn effects will trigger during this phase as well. So if you watched the first video and we were talking about the setup, we saw that uh, at the beginning of the game, the captains are all shuffled, and one of them is chosen, um, either randomly or by the players, to be the commander, the main captain, the last guy who has to be defeated in order to end the game. So they're just another captain, but they've been selected for that role in this particular instance. So commanders are also captains. They're going to act just like other captains, and they're going to activate during this, this captain turn abilities phase. Okay, and then location control tokens. All control tokens on locations controlled by the active player's faction are flipped face up. So this is just an upkeep. Now, we couldn't call it the upkeep phase because this is an upkeep. Um, but locations are... Um, controlled by the faction, not by the player. So um, both players are going to have this benefit. And so both players during their faction phase are going to do these two things. So this is just a minor upkeep. This is just activating those turn abilities. Very, very simple before we get into the action phase, which is the main deck building phase of the game. Play cards, activate locations. The active player plays cards from their hand to purchase cards for their deck. Capture cards. I'm sorry. Capture cards belonging to the opposing faction or destroy cards. So there's a number of things you can do here. They all involve purchasing cards with the resources you generate in classic deck building style. Okay, so you could play the cards from your hand to generate resources. Then you're going to purchase cards for your deck. You're going to capture cards belonging to the opposing faction, which is just purchasing them. But instead of them going to your deck, they're going to go to a separate capture pile. They're not used um, you can't use them the same way you can these cards that you bought for your deck. Or you could destroy cards. Units can be captured. Other things are destroyed when you purchase them. So these are all just purchases that you're making. It's just what happens to the card after it's purchased that's making the difference here. Location abilities on locations under your faction's control may be used at any time during the action phase. Flip the control token on the location face down when an ability is used. Okay, so each 
Each location has a control token for the faction to show who's in control of that location because those locations can change hands over the course of the game. Um, and that contr and control token, we're also going to use it to kind of mark when we did an ability uh, or when it's still available. So on one side it'll have maybe an emblem, on the other side it'll be blank or something, and, you know, whatever. You flip it over to, to say, all right, I did that already. So these are, these are permanent cards whose abilities um, don't trigger automatically, you trigger them when you want. Um, so you can do those things. So they're basically cards available to both players of the faction on every turn. They're a standing card that you can use. Um, and so they're part of playing your cards, because in effect they're an extension of your hand. So you're playing cards in activating locations, it's kind of the same thing. So that's all what's happening during the action phase, that's your main deck building phase. Then you play all your cards, they're down in your play area, you did what you want to do, now we go into the assault phase. The assault phase um, is when we're going to contest control of locations. So you don't have to do this. This is something you, you may do. So you see, declare, continue, or resolve an assault. The player may declare an assault against the location controlled by the opposing faction. So you don't have to do this. Most turns you're going to go buy in your cards, and that's it, it's all done for the most part. Uh, if you want to launch an assault, if you want to try and wrest, you know, control away from um, your opponent and take over one of those locations, one of those standing cards that you could use every turn, this is when you're going to do it, after you played cards. If an assault has already <coughs> been declared, the march will continue or the assault will resolve during this phase. So see assaults page, we don't know what page it is because our rulebook doesn't have pages, our rulebook is just a, a list of stuff that happens. Um, when it is a rulebook, then we'll put in here the page which will explain what are they talking about with the march continuing, the assault resolving. Um, just so you know to satisfy curiosity in the moment, when an assault is made, the, the, um, your army has to march on that location. You don't just instantly appear there and assault. So it takes two turns, uh, you know, notwithstanding abilities that change that. It takes two turns to get there and make the attack. Um, so there's a token that's used to represent that. So we call that the marching token. So if you declared an assault last turn, this turn you're going to flip that token over from the two side to the one side because it's a two-turn march, um, so the march will continue, you flip that token over, or if it's already on the one side, then the assault is going to resolve this turn during this phase. Okay, so you may declare an assault, but if an assault has already been declared, this stuff's going to happen. This isn't optional. You're, you're heading in, it's going to happen. The assault phase itself happens whether an assault has been declared or not for the purpose of effects that take place during this phase. So, if you have a card that says, during the assault phase, do this, and nobody's making an assault, we don't want this phase to just not happen, and then those effects don't come into play. The assault phase happens, most of the time nothing will happen during it, and we'll just go to the next phase. So it'll be like a silent phase. Um, okay, and then we go to the end of turn. <laughs> so, reserve cards. This is a way of banking cards from one turn to another, um, but not in the way that you see in maybe like uh, Warhammer High Command where you just bank a card and then it's added to your hand the next turn. This is called the reserves. Unplayed cards may be put aside in the active player's reserves pile for future use. See reserves page, whatever. The reserves pile is a place that you could put cards you haven't played that turn um, and then use them during assaults. You can get cards in and out of the reserves in other ways, which we'll talk about next, but they're mainly used to put things away for an assault. So when you go to do an assault, your reserve pile is going to become part of your hand, and the defender's reserve pile is going to become part of their hand. That's why this marching thing becomes important, because um, if the player sees you coming, they're going to start stacking away reserves and, and you know being prepared to defend. Um, in the same way, if you start putting away reserves, you know, somebody might start thinking, hey, this guy's getting ready to launch an assault, you know, what's he up to? Okay, so this is a way of having more cards available to you when you actually make an assault, but we can get cards in and out of this reserve pile in other ways. Then you're going to do your typical discard draw step. 
Um, all other cards in the player's hand and those that were played during previous phases of the turn are now discarded. A new hand of five cards is drawn. So in classic deck building style, you're going to discard everything and you're going to start with a new fresh hand. The only thing that's going to still be there is your reserve cards. They don't get discarded. Although they can be, but that's a subject for another discussion. It's an option. Okay, so you discarded, you drew up a new hand. Now you're going to refresh your faction row if necessary. So this isn't always going to happen. If you didn't buy any cards or gain any cards and no cards were destroyed in the row belonging to your faction, then you're going to choose one card in that row to be destroyed. All right. So now you might be familiar with this idea. Um, this is a way of churning the deck. Uh, I don't know if I want to say that, but just refreshing, keeping things moving, making sure cards are coming out of that deck. So if you have five cards in your row and you decide not to do anything with them, one of those cards has to be destroyed so a new card can enter the line. Something new is going to enter each turn. We have to keep cards coming out of that deck, especially because both factions have rows and you can purchase from either row. So, um, you know, remember the captains, if you watch the setup video, are coming out every 10th card in the deck. Every 10th card is going to be a captain. So you may want to manipulate that. Make sure your captain doesn't come out yet if you think you're going to get defeated quickly. You're not ready. Or, um, you know, try and get the opponent's captain to come out sooner. And You know, th th these, this is part of the game. But we want to make sure that nobody could just stall that process completely. So refreshing your faction row. If you don't do anything with your deck, no cards are removed. I'm sorry, from your, from your, your lineup of cards. If, if nothing is removed, you're going to remove something and put out a new card. Then you're going to refill the active field as usual. So if there are less than five cards in either faction's row, draw cards from the corresponding faction deck to fill the empty slots until there are at least five cards in each row. <coughs> so just refilling the, the, the lineup in that, in that case. And then reveal commander if necessary. If the commander of either faction has no commander tokens remaining, flip it face up and place it into the battlefield and resolve its arrival effect. So <coughs> each faction has a commander. There's only two factions. This reveal commander step is only going to happen twice in every game. So this isn't a step that we're thinking about most of the time. It's happening at the end of the game, and it's only happening twice. All right, so you see, if necessary, if necessary, if necessary. This is an optional phase. So these things, <coughs> excuse me, aren't happening all the time. So it looks like a lot, but I think, um, well, I know from playing it, it's not. When you're actually playing it, it's all kind of intuitive. But of course, I would say that because I came up with all of this stuff, or at least, you know, um, uh, kind of molded it to my own purposes from all the other games I've played and whatnot. But, you know, this is, this is something I'm very used to. So you tell me. I mean, does this sound like a lot? I know I took a lot of time discussing it because, again, my purpose is not to explain my game. It's to discuss uh, game design ideas. So we're talking about all this stuff at length. But, you know, just to take a, take a look at it, do you think that it's a lot for a player to take in? Um, let me know what you think about that. Uh, is there anything you see here that's extraneous? You, you might not be able to tell right now because you don't know all the rules to the game. But just at first glance, is there something you look at and you say, well, what, what is that about? You know, you don't need that. I tried to be brief in how I described it as well. And I, I tried to, um, you know, keep it under these four main headings. So that way, we can remember that there's four phases, and then once we think about a particular phase, our brain can then remember maybe a few things about that phase. So it's compart compartmentalizing the information. So it's like, you know, you're going into the door of your mind that's talking about the, uh, you know, end of turn phase, and then you just remember this. You're not thinking about everything at once, okay? So just breaking things down. I mean, you know, this is obviously... Uh, very common, you know, common sense way of handling this sort of thing um, in talking about rules. And now we're into the rules glossary, okay? So <clears throat> that's the entirety of the turn sequence. Um, you can see how a lot of this stuff uh, has some interplay with each other, you know, reserve cards. You're putting cards into your reserves. When can you do that? You know, it, it sh this used to be up higher in this thing, but it caused some problems with some of the cards that I had and stuff like that. Um, and so this is the way things shook out. Now we got the assault phase happening before this reserve cards. Because here you played cards, right? So you would say, well, okay, I played all my cards, now I can reserve cards. 
<clears throat> but um, I wanted to get this assault phase in between that process. So now it shakes out this way. That's why there's a division between when you're playing cards and when you're reserving cards. This reserving cards is now becoming part of what's happening at the end of the turn after the dust settles from everything else. Okay, so <clears throat> in the rules glossary section, we're not going to get into this because this would basically just be talking about the game. Um, and, uh, you know, from time to time we may refer to it just to, uh, just to kind of, you know, bring up certain points and things like that. But I want to stop here and leave it at the turn summary. <clears throat> if you um, are working on a game um, and you're struggling with turn sequence, bring it up. Let's talk about it. Let's see if we can, you know, uh, I don't know, kind of uh, shake out, you know, the the gold dust of it. You know what I'm saying? Let's see if we can kind of like get through all the all the things that kind of um, are a burr on a, on the process, and kind of just shake out what's you know really a value in in turn sequences. All right, well, thanks for checking in. Next time when we come back, we're going to look at um, how we handled the card allotment and uh, designing and developing um, the cards for the game. All right, I'll see you next time.